Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're going to get started. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to use the Q&A uh, button on the bottom right hand side of your of your Zoom window. Um, if you're having uh, any uh, technical issues or anything like that, you can put them in the chat as well. Uh, we will be monitoring that during uh, John's presentation. Um, if you have a question, uh, you know, about what John's speaking about at the moment, you can raise your hand um, and um, and uh, you're you're free to we'll, we'll unmute you so you can ask your question during the presentation. Um, I also want to point out that um, we will be recording this presentation and it'll be available on uh, the Great Valley Launchbox uh, YouTube channel uh, in a couple of days. All right. Um, let's get started. I'd like to introduce John Wodehouse. Uh, John is a finance, economic, business, and leadership instructor with the Penn State University Extension with a focus on agriculture, landscape business, financial management, and leadership development. Prior to Penn State, John's career experience included farming, landscape management, design and sales, as well as facilities management and higher education. John brings a wealth of industry expertise to strengthen all his extension product projects. Currently, his work is focused on farm finances, food systems, and leadership empowerment. John holds a master's in leadership development from the Penn State University and a Bachelor of Business Administration and Finance from Albright College. We're very thankful for John being here today, and uh, I think you're really going to enjoy his presentation. So, John, I will turn it over to you. Leo, thank you so much. A nice introduction. I always feel humbled when I when I hear those. I appreciate that. Thanks. I'd like to welcome everybody today. We're going to get into a little a few discussions on farming from the entrepreneurial lens. And what I'll do is I'll share my screen and I have a few slides and uh, we'll kind of go from there. So when I go into uh, start, everybody ought to be seeing, we believe that all people should have access to science-based education. Is that right, Leo? And Becky, do you guys see that? I see it, but it's not in the full screen. There you go, perfect. All right, that's great. So yeah, Penn State Extension. We're under the Penn State umbrella. So Leo and Becky and I are colleagues. We work for the, I work for the College of Ag Science through the Penn State uh, Extension, which is a land grant uh, nonprofit through Penn State University. And we do believe that everybody has access to the, to the science-based education. Um, part of a top 20 research institution, and uh, we like to think that the information is acceptable, uh, acceptable and accessible to you when and where you want it. Uh, we have specialized teams of experts like myself. In the introduction, Leo I had mentioned that I do have finance and business as a background, and I have farming as experience, and I'm happy to share all that with you today. A little bit more about who we are here. Uh, Penn State Extension is uh, a collection of educators. We're like adult uh, teachers. We have uh, associates which help with research grants, uh, educational opportunities. We, we all link back to a faculty member or two or three on main campus that help with uh, research initiatives. And we, as extension educators, get out into the local communities and do uh, workshops, programs, do um, at market farming events and things like that. This is all the areas that Penn State Extension covers, in case you're not sure or didn't know this before, but 4-H is part of uh, Penn State. For those of you that might have uh, kids in 4-H or in the animal sciences, we also cover um, agronomy, natural resources, animal systems, that's livestock, poultry, energy business and community vitality. That's the team that I'm on. So I study the uh, business and community vitality, leadership and finance. We have a division of extension with a uh, focus on food, families, and health, and also food safety and quality, which is a big one. And it's part of the programmatic development 
areas that I'm uh, passionate about, as well as the uh, share a passion for the horticulture. So without further ado, I'll jump right into tonight's um, program. Leo had asked me to do some work in growing entrepreneurs, which is uh, starting a food and farming business. So I put my research hat on and compiled a few slides on just that. If you wanted to dig a little bit deeper into tonight, after tonight, you can look into any of these courses and workshops that Penn State puts together. I'm involved with, let's see, all of these, Food for Profit, Farm Sense, New and Beginning Farmers, a lot of the marketing, leadership development in agriculture and natural resources, starting a farm business, exploring the farm, farm dream is a short uh, four week workshop that we do on, uh, that I've modeled a lot of tonight on. And then we also, not only will we show you how to begin a business or the genesis of a farming idea, we'll show you how to transition it and uh, plan your real estate, whether it's through a trust or an irrevocable trust or an LLC to the next generation and beyond. And you can't really see it, but it's uh, http double backslash extension.psu.edu. It's in blue and it's a little bit hard to see. But anyway, here's the fields of agriculture. For those of you that are interested in understanding like what agriculture is and how big it is in our country, it includes horticulture, ornamentals, greenhouse, land management, turf grass, uh, College of Ag Science, small animal care, that's the livestock, uh, farm machine and some shop classes, food families, health and nutrition is part of agriculture, and then livestock management and some, some sections of uh, biology with, uh, with forest ecology in there too. So when I think about starting a business, I think about the idea of starting a business that starts up here in our minds. And I just, I just can't, I would be remiss if I didn't mention just everybody's story is going to start a little different, right? Everybody's story is going to start a little different. I remember in 1983, my first venture was selling baby vegetables to a distributor in Millville, PA. Now that's a quote that I have. And then along the way, the, you know, the, the vegetables in this story of the start of my business, which is a scenario story that I'm telling you, I don't have my own farming business, but it might have been, you have an opportunity to distribute somewhere. Then you have another opportunity of a restaurant that you can get involved with. And you have another opportunity where there might be a complex of homes going in that you see as an opportunity. So you can network with their, that them for uh, some customers. Maybe you start a second business. Maybe you have kids along the way in, in this business life that you need to uh, pave the way for to come home and work on the farm. But it all starts with, I remember back in 90, 1983 when my first venture. So for those of you that are on with me tonight, and I'm very thankful for the opportunity to share the time, has any of you ever wondered what it takes to start a farm to fork business or to take your small farm idea that you may have tonight inside your mind or something like that from a hobby to a business? We did launch a little poll here. It's just a yes or no question. Let's kind of get an idea of what you folks are thinking of. There we go. I suspected that. So we have 100% participation. Thanks so much. And yeah, you're thinking about starting a, a small farm from a hobby to a business. Well, hopefully tonight we'll have a couple of tidbits of information, if not quite a few, that'll help you get that uh, dream to reality. Click out of the poll there. There we go. How do you know you have an idea that stands out for agriculture? These are rhetorical questions. Are you a natural born leader? And do natural born leaders even exist? I think that leadership in my master's degree, I focused a lot on the idea that yes, leadership can be learned. The traits, personality traits, attitudes of the people usually remain pretty much constant, but the ability to generate inspiration and pa uh, passion 
instill passion in others is a, a learnable trait. I think that when we look at how do you know when your idea stands out, you can see the picture here. It goes from no focal point to a focal point. Boom, it shoots out right in red. Whether you're an agricultural entrepreneur or an entrepreneur for a startup business in tech or any other industry, there is a, a character trait and ability to have intense focus and maintain a positive mindset. Figure out and overcome your fears and then embrace your ability to learn and grow and free yourself from what they call in business psychology a fixed mindset. In other words, it's always going to be that way or you, you talk yourself into the idea rather than talk yourself out of the idea. But it all revolves around having an intense focus and an open mind. So let's take a minute here to see if we have natural born entrepreneurs with us. Or maybe you have personality traits that are more leaning toward the idea of entrepreneurism or, or I'm sorry, entrepreneurship. Your personality, uh, creative, it doesn't fit the nine to five lifestyle. That's me. I'll be the first person to say that. Do you love learning new things? Sure do. Do your ideas seem perhaps crazy or a little out there? Yeah. I bet you when the first iPhone that was a handheld computer was pitched, it was a little crazy too, but now all darn near everybody in America has one or two of them. Do you wanna create something with a deeper meaning? Now this is where it touches base in agriculture. And do you wanna make the world a better place? Maybe some of these things resonate with you, maybe not, but these are some of the things that research tells us that uh, entrepreneurs have, in addition to problem solvers and constantly looking for a better way or a new way to do something, whether it's in agriculture or out of agriculture. So when we think of roles and responsibilities of the entrepreneur or the farmer, we have the leader, the follower, contributor, the growing, a uh, grower, the marketer, you might be an innovator, you have uh, personal hobbies and your relationship with your community. And uh, lastly, but not leastly, we have uh, friends, neighbors, and a good community citizen. So if we start an agricultural enterprise or a farm business, we are part of the community and we're, we, we fit into all these different colorful little squares here among many others. I just picked a few to talk about tonight. You know, uh, it's really interesting to think about starting a farm that feeds people or provides an agricultural product to somebody or a set of families that are going to be feeding your products to their children that are going to go into their bodies and nurture them and allow them to grow and all that thing. It's, it really feels good to be a farmer. There's a fella in leadership development that kind of digs a little bit deeper into this idea of a leader and an entrepreneur. And I like to bring this into workshops. His name is Simon Sinek. Has anybody ever heard of him? I bet you Leo has in his background. I just have a small video clip of what Simon uh, views as an entrepreneur and a leader. And if, if I would be okay to, I'll just go ahead and see if I can't play it from the time I have here, which is 1.20. Five. Hopefully this will come through in the audio. You folks will be able to hear this. There are small business owners and there are entrepreneurs. What's an entrepreneur? And you can find entrepreneurs in big companies. It doesn't mean that they're small business owners, right? I think entrepreneurs are problem solvers. I think rather than risk takers. Yeah. I think fundamentally there are plenty of risk takers. I think who are entrepreneurs. There's a risk taker if you're a small business owner, right? You went out to start the business, but they're not the same. I don't think. Um, and entrepreneurs are those ones who they're constantly looking to solve problems. And that's where I think they perceive opportunity or the mischief that you describe. I don't think it's, I don't think inherently it's a sense of mischief. They're not trying to stir the pot for the sake of stirring the pot. I think that they see something and they're like, we can make that better, or we can fill that hole. And that's very much the way the famous entrepreneurs, the Elon Musk's and the Richard Branson's operate. They see gap. I think that's pretty interesting. seeing a gap in an industry or seeing a way to do something better. So on in this little clip here, I would like to show you Mark Cuban, another uh, famous entrepreneur, businessman, his take on uh, entrepreneurship. And that starts at 946. And it's just a little couple seconds here on Mark's view on it. Really not 
the best at scrolling, but I'm doing my best, Leo, here to see if I can't see 946. There we go. This is Mark Cuban on starting a business or an entrepreneurship idea. Problems, reduce stress, make people's lives easier. Because that's what we all look for, yeah. right? In school, you want to get through class. You want to get good grades, and you're looking for the best way to do that. When you start a business, you want to make your customers happy. You want to make it so that they don't think about going anywhere else. Um, but again, you always got to think about your own consumer experiences. What is it about, what is it that you look for? And that tends to guide you. Would you buy from your own companies? You know, and you got to be honest with yourself because not all companies are going to be great, but my most successful companies understand. I actually think that's pretty interesting. I like that. You know, folks, if you're thinking about starting an agricultural enterprise or an idea in farming, I think at the end of the day, if you're eating your own products, you know, you're giving people samples of what you grow, um, educating people on what makes your product stand out, product differentiation, and uh, you would buy from your own company. If you believe in your own company, other people are going to believe in you as well. So I showed you a couple of uh, ideas about the mindset of why go into farming. Now we're going to start into uh, what could we farm? you know, or why would we farm? We, we want to get into farming, not because we love machinery, because machinery is a giant capital investment. We want to get into farming, not because you have the land. And I'm, I put this in here because in my position as a Chester County Penn State Extension educator, one of the biggest questions that I get is access to land farmers or the aspiring farmer agriculture producer might not have the land if you have the land that's great that's a barrier to entry down you know even if you have a small piece of land you can still farm but if you don't have land you can find it you can lease it we want to get into farming not for the cycles and consumer demand shifts people's ch taste changes so farming is seasonality so if you're want to keep things pretty much the same year round, it wouldn't do farming. Uh, profits in farming aren't like the profits in other industries. In other words, profit margins that I see on the farm financial management classes that I have that we get some data on aren't, aren't giant. They're not 40, 50, 80, 100%. They're somewhere between three and 13%. And if you wanna keep clean fingernails, Maybe farming isn't for you. I say, if these are all reasons why we don't do it, the biggest reason here is we do it for the lifestyle, right? This, this idea that we're part of something bigger. You know, we're part of a food system. We're part of our community. And here's me a couple of years ago with the little gravely at my parents' family farm. I don't need to do any sort of photo release on this picture because there's nobody else in it but me, but that's, that's the essence of some Many farmers that I know, they just like being out underneath the sun, rolling on a piece of equipment, you know, getting things ready to plant. Um, speaking of that, let's take a couple ideas here of uh, what farming could be. You could start a farming business in vegetable or herb production. You know, herbs are a big one. You can dry herbs into tea. You can grow any sort of fresh produce from your garden, sweet, sweet corn, tomatoes, melons. Are pretty big sellers at the local farm markets. Uh, you can take a interest in fresh berries and fruit. You can do medicinal herbs, fresh or dried, any of the culinary herbs too that you can link with a local restaurant. If you're a beekeeper or you have a love for honey, you can take classes from Penn State and others on how to become a beekeeper and then sell local honey. You can make uh, handmade scarves. I put this one in here because right now I have a lady in one of my classes that has alpacas and she makes scarves and she sells them out in Western Pennsylvania, hats, mittens, socks, baby blankets and quilts. And she has a small inventory. One of the rising subsets of agriculture that we're seeing here is potted flowers and hanging baskets. Now these are at the farm market uh, locations as sort of like a tie in, you know, you're buying some vegetables and oh my goodness, look, there's a, caliber coa hanging basket for 10.99 and people end up purchasing those we're seeing a movement penn state a lot in the uh 
the backyard chickens or fresh eggs, chicken, ducks, and quail eggs. Not so much quail eggs, but chickens and ducks. That's our, that's, we're seeing that. Farming ideas, this, these bottom ones here are bold because they're pretty big. In, in the world that I'm in here for, um, for calls that we get in the county and throughout the state. So the idea of micro farmer, people that don't have hundreds of acres, micro greens, these, uh, these sprouts and small, almost portable hydroponic uh, operations that can grow what we call succession plantings, or you can grow radish sprouts or bean sprouts in like 11 or 12 days and sell them to the local restaurant at a markup. If you do have the land, the real estate, the beautiful picturesque countryside, maybe it's something that you have in your family or has been in your family for generations, so like a heritage farm, you can um, maybe have a you pick on there. If you have some apple trees, you can turn your farm into a maze. There's some farm mazes seasonally down along Route 23 in Northern Chester and Lancaster County. You might have a great place that you have an Airbnb or you could have bonfires there or weddings. I'm seeing that a lot in Berks and Lancaster County. If you have a beautiful sunset, you could open up the farm with the right liability insurance. And I'm gonna get there in a few slides on uh, photo opportunities. And then of course, you might be able to uh, look into livestock raising and selling animals. Just some farming ideas. I wasn't sure exactly what direction to take this portion of tonight whether it's an idea generation course or just sort of, or not a course, like a workshop or just, just an overall, okay, what could I do if I want to become a farmer? So I have a couple more pretty cool ideas here on the next slide. Broiler chickens. Now this involves a little bit more of a capital investment. You know, a 70 by 300 building is half a million dollars. Um, growing greens and microgreens. It's another one. This is part of the vegetable industry. You could you could sell wholesale or retail or at farmers markets, or you could do a delivery or set up an online ordering system and do online order with delivery. Rabbits are another business idea in agriculture that you might want to look into if you're uh, an animal lover. One of my favorites is the nursery industry, which you would grow nursery stock and or cut flowers. And uh, I put specialty mushrooms here as the, as the final idea for tonight, only because I know quite a bit about mushrooms, having been in the industry for a little while, about a year and a quarter. It's not in my bio, Leo, but I did work in the, in the mushroom industry for a little bit. And I found that <clears throat> there's, there's pretty good profit margin if you can keep your costs of goods sold low into the specialty mushroom market. And I took that picture of the topiary down at a local nursery in Chester. So when we have all these ideas for farming, we have them in our minds. What do you suppose we can do to get them out of our heads and uh, into a real startup business? You know, I think it's always fun to think about using your existing resources and what resources you can leverage. Not only what physical resources you have, but the non-physical resources too, like your intellect, your curiosity, your character virtues, your leadership ability. <coughs> Excuse me. There was a fellow that started a business that didn't have direct farming experience, but he had accounting and record keeping. So he teamed up with somebody that did have some production agriculture experience and started a farm business about five years ago and has been keeping in touch with me ever since, which I thought was pretty neat how he knew that uh, he needed to form a team to help guide him. So he invested in that. Penn State Extension, Penn State University, College of Ag Science, and all of the other land grant universities can help you get the production and business training that you need for the industry. So this would be the agriculture and food systems industry. And the best piece of advice that I can give you from my heart as John and my educator hat on here as Mr. Wodehouse is uh, to start small and scale up. You know, the, you increase your likelihood of the break even and profit if you start small and scale. So in around the Chester County area, there are a number of other farms, which is the competitive market. And I, I took a couple minutes here and 
wanted to show some Chester County stats. And I think these stats are interesting when you look at them from many different lenses. So what you're looking at here is value of farm by uh, sales and the number of farms. So look, for example, here we have, where's my pointer? Do I have a pointer? Right here, 536 farms are less than $2,500. Isn't that interesting? As of 2017. And this number might've went up or down a percent or two till 2021, but this is the most recent ag census in Chester County. So it's also interesting to look when we think here, this is 33% of the whole. And the, the other 30 or so percent here is farms of $100,000 or more. So in between here, there aren't a whole lot of farms that are doing 2,500 to 5,000. So I think that there's room, there's room in the market for more. There's room in the market for this uh, 2,500 to 25,000. So th these might be a part-time legit farm business that you're, that you have an EIN number, that you have an LLC or, um, or sole proprietorship not just the a couple of a couple of sales out of the front garden. We're talking about starting a legit a legitimate business. So check out the sizes here. We have uh, 485 farms in our county that have 50 to 179 acres. Not in Chester County, but my family farm would be right in here. And you know this has to do with the uh, capital infrastructure necessary to sustain a farm family living expense off of revenues generated from the farm. I, I know that's a big sentence, but they're sort of like jumps that you get in here to be able to have profit enough to, uh, to sustain a good quality of living in our, in our county and others. So that's why we don't see a whole lot of farms like over a thousand acres in Chester, but also because I think Chester is about 770 square miles. They're just, aren't that many large tracts of land in Chester anymore owned by one, one person or one entity. We have some large farmers in Chester County, but they don't own all the land. They're renting or leasing ground to. So here I have one more slide on some Chester County stats. I bet you some of these will, will, will be impressive, if to say the least, for, uh, for our, ourselves as Chester County residents. Nursery, greenhouse, floriculture, and sod. Check this out here. The value of sales, this is times 1,515. And our rank in the state is number one. We're first in the state for nursery, greenhouse, and floriculture. Does anybody want to take a stab at maybe what industry would propel us so far out of everybody else in the, in the, in the state? Any takers, Becky or Leo? Anybody in the chat? I'll share for the sake of time. It's because we have the mushroom industry in Chester County. We have Kennett, uh, the, the, the lower southwestern portion of Chester County has a lot of agriculture in it. And quite a few of these tobacco farms and uh, mushroom houses are down in that area. So uh, cultivated Christmas tree, short rotation of woody crops. This is uh, 14th in the state and 69th. So this is by county, 69th of all counties in the continental United States. Pretty neat. This stuff is available at uh, chestercounty.org. So when we look at Chester County agriculture, we have almost 2,000 farms. We have about 170,000 acres in farmland. 60,000 are preserved, and it's 759 square miles. Pretty big county. We're second in the state when we conglomerate or aggregate all of our farming products. Pennsylvania as a whole, the Keystone State has about 60,000 plus, about 63,000 farms as of 2017. Almost $8 million, of far, uh, million, dollars, million acres of farmland. And when you run that number, it's about a third of the state. Uh, this is a uh, 6.1 billion in in agriculture. That's uh, gross cash receipts. <clears throat> when we think of dairy, we think of uh, why Hershey would have started a chocolate company in uh, Pennsylvania. It's because we have a lot of dairies. We're fifth nationally in dairy production yeah, for milk. And uh, 
The little bullet with the round hole there in it has uh, the average age of our farmer is 53. And just over 20% are 65 or over. And it, I always, always have to kind of frown that only 1% of our farmers are under 25. 10% are female, which is actually a growing number. We have quite a few more females in agriculture, even in the last eight years that I've been your extension educator in Chester County. And then I can also tell you here that farm ownership of uh, sole proprietorships is 91% of those uh, farms in Chester. It's pretty neat here in Pennsylvania as a whole, we have all, over a thousand Christmas tree farms. One of the first jobs I ever had in agriculture was working on a Christmas tree farm. So I put that in there just for your enjoyment and mine. So back to the idea of starting a farm, right? So let's say we're gonna start a farm. These are questions to ask yourself. Do you have the land? Do you have a little bit of land or no land at all? And if you have a lot or a little, what can you do with it? Can you think through ways to meet customer demand? In other words, if you have the best recipe for strawberry jelly, but you're time strapped not to make the strawberry jelly, you can't meet demand. Maybe you need to hire it out, <clears throat> sell the recipe. This idea of prioritize with focus, this 80-15-5, this is, um, these are percentages. 80 percent. Focus your energy on the 80% uh, of your energy on your top sellers or your, the top ideas that you have, 15% of your time and energy on the ideas that you can make your future top sellers and invest a little bit of your time always to have the brand new ideas and the, the, next, the next idea for maybe the next couple of years. In other words, keep your, keep your eye on what might be a new trend. How about finances here? What do your finances look like now? How much money or investment could you have from either a small loan, friends and family into getting this business idea started up? Do you have a team or could you form one? And then if you do have the land, whether it's a lot of land or a little, what's your facility look like? Do you have an existing pole barn that you could renovate? Do you have already a stand down somewhere near the road that you could put vegetables out in if you have a small garden that's, that's growing, <laughs> no pun intended, both in size and production? Stuff like that. So you leverage your existing resources and you find ways to get those existing resources to measure up. And one thing that we want to do here, actually I have quite a few that we can do, is have clear leadership goals. You can figure out how you're to impact your industry beyond just a percent of market share. So we want to be a steward of our community, a steward of our land, figure out ways to make make an impact, make and sell superior products, better goods and services than somebody else. And I also want to add in there, make and sell superior products that you can't find in the grocery store. <laughs> it seems kind of intuitive, but if you have people know that they can find specialty products on your farm, they're going to come back for them. From my leadership background here, grow the people first within your business, have a commitment to their transformational uh, leadership abilities, the abilities for they themselves to run crews, hold on to responsibility, have them believe in your purpose and the profits will follow. Have a stance on uh, understanding that you do lead your own business culture. You know, you have the ability to have a cohesive look on your farm or with your branding, things like that. Check out some of these different leadership objectives of starting an actual business. You know, so if someone said, how do you actually start a business? I would say, well, you call a lawyer and either start an LLC or a sole proprietorship and get a tax ID number, uh, open up a bank account in that entity or in your your last name and start using it to pay all of your expenses for your business. There's a lot more to it than that. You know, to becoming established, we have to look at order of operations that lead to your launch, check out all the regulations, look at any tie-ins that you might have, your managerial structure, and then finances. 
but I've been asked that question so many times of how to start an agriculture business that I have that elevator speech of that's what you do, which I said about the EIN number and stuff, but it, it is a little bit deeper than that. Let me see if I can get on here to my next slide. Take a look also when you're looking at an agriculture business of uh, what's already on your plate. You know, I have I have two different ways to show the same thing right here. What you're seeing on the, whoops, what you're seeing on the left is my backyard with my car in the background, but we're looking at a plate with a whole bunch of different words that you can't really see, you know. It says the same thing that's on the right here, marketing and publicity, discuss your pre and post opening plan, look at public relations and marketing, company perhaps, but if it's not clear to you like it is in the picture on the left with that funny background of the, the table, the plate, you know, dinner, it's not going to be clear to you as far as which ideas to focus on first. That's why I put them in a bullet point here over on the right because it's crystal clear and they're in blue writing. The bullets on the left exactly are the same as the bullets on the right. And the second one is if you need a specialist or a consultant, turn to outside accountant services to help, uh, take advantage of the uh, designers for labeling, things like that. Call on extension, call on contractors. When you're looking at the financial capital to start up a business, uh, you can create realistic scenarios and projections, how many units, what your yields are gonna be, how big of a geographical area you're looking to uh, enter your product into the agricultural market and uh, choose an accountant in the industry. We have agriculture specific accountants in, in uh, farming and natural resources. Let's look at sort of some of this in, in a little bit more of a flow here. An agriculture business plan is a little bit different than a conventional business plan in that it, it contains a lot of the things that I talked about earlier, but it also will contain uh, business structure. Well, I guess it'll contain cover page contents and executive summary mission and vision, background industry of yourself as the entrepreneur and the industry, which is the internal and external audit or a fit, best fit in the industry where, where, your, where your product meets, meets the road, <laughs> where your rubber meets the road. The business plan just helps you organize it. You'll include within your business plan a, a little sub plan that is like a marketing idea, what products you're gonna sell, what services you're gonna to put together, an analysis of your market and some strategies and tactics to uh, what they call penetrate the market. I love the financial aspect of the, the business plan, doing cash flow, a balance sheet projection and a P&L, which is your profit and loss uh, statement projections. The most important one that the, the financial lender or the loan institution is going to look, look for is, uh, is the cash flow. They're going to take a peek at your balance sheet to find your net worth, your debt to equity ratio, but really they're going to look at the cash flow to find your repayment capacity for any type of loan that you might need to start the business. I'll tell people every day of the week that ask me if I start a farm business, I want to grow this. I want to grow cut flowers. I'd like to get into the hemp market. I'd like to do this. I'd like to check out specialty grains. I always sell. I always tell them, who are you going to sell it to? What's your market? Do you have an end user already? Because without thinking through to when you're going to sell that product down the road, when the days to harvest come up, if you sow a seed today and it takes 62 days for that or 72 days for that tomato to mature on that 73rd, 74, 75th day, if it's not sold, it's spoiled, you know, and it's resources, uh, under, under, underused resources or maybe, maybe waste. If you're looking at a lean management model in business, it would be wasteful. So take a long look at what you're going to produce, how to price it, 
Extension and others, colleges, short courses on business can talk with you about fixed costs, uh, variable costs, uh, overhead, markup, and margin. I do some quite a bit of focus on distribution and then promotion, which is sort of like a new way to say promoting your product is to educate your customers and your, your clients on what makes your product what it is. I think when you go to farmer's markets, selling a product, there is a technique and a pitch and a menu that you might have some of your younger employees try and memorize almost, you know, so they know certain things, features and attributes and benefits about heirloom tomatoes or specialty green pepper or whatever that product might be that you're, you're uh, into at that time or that you're having one of your employees try and sell or you're trying to sell. Um, you call it a menu or the pitch. So marketing is very, very key to any business, whether it's in agriculture or not. This marketing plan grows. Includes your market research, goals to help you mark your way, and then strategies. So marketing strategies are processes to get the product from the farm to the customer. And in my class called Food for Profit, and this is kind of like what, what Leo and I started talking about with um, with tonight's tonight's workshop is, I mean, it, the process of getting the product for the farm to the customer, there's a model out there called the, the four Ps, the five Ps and the seven Ps of marketing, which is like product, price, placement, promotion, physical resources. There's a whole bunch of them. That's not what the course is about tonight here. I just wanted to kind of plant that seed and have you look into a little bit of your own research on what that seven and five P marketing model is and how it can work for you. One of my personal favorites that I don't talk about too much at Penn State Extension, but I absolutely love this model is what's called the, the save model of marketing. It's the, it's the same approach, but from a different angle. So instead of looking at your product you're looking at your product as a solution. So that's the S in the, in the save. And the, the A is the placement in the 4P model or the 5P model. Harvard Business came up with this idea that we give access. We, we provide access to our, to our products. Uh, the V is uh, value in this marketing model. That would be uh, above utility value. And E would be the formerly known as promotion in the four Ps. In this one, it's called education. So we educate our customers. We give them a solution to their problem. And I always tell the same story a hundred times a year when I do this, but think of it like this. Do you buy a bottle of water? And I don't promote any sort of bottled water, but it's a great example. It'll resonate. If you buy a bottle of water just to buy the bottle of water, who does that? I mean, maybe just to have it on hand, but you buy a bottle of water to solve your thirst problem. Think of it. It's just a little different framework to think of growing your marketing plan in agriculture because the person that buys your heirloom tomato at $5 a pound could buy a tomato anywhere else for $2.50 a pound. Why would they, why, what problem of the, your heirloom tomato is solving for them? You can uh, kick that out there in a, a little excerpt on your website or in a marketing campaign or tell them at the farmer's market, this is why these heirloom tomatoes are so wonderful. Keeping on with marketing here, we budget a lot in agriculture uh, to do revenue potentials. And those, of course, are called pro formas. We come up with action plans based on our marketing to actually, like, okay, let's put some of this down here and get some dates to these, we'll, you know, launching this having that commercial, maybe we do a social media blitz and we have action plans for each of these in, in academia and in agriculture, most other businesses alike. We wanna make sure that we review and monitor our business plan and uh, make changes as we go. One of the nuances that always uh, surprises me in agriculture, vegetables, herbs, is that quality is everything. And to get a high quality product means that it's gotta be safe, right? So here we have food is a risky business. And 
to help guide agricultural producers, whether you're an entrepreneur or a worker, there are several factors here underneath this left side here called good agricultural practices and good handling practices. And these acronyms are GAP and GIP, GAP, G-H-P and G-A-P-S. These are some guidelines from entities out there that are coming up with, you know, if you're if you're bringing lettuce in out of the field, the water that you rinse that lettuce in to get the heat out of the lettuce has to be a certain temperature and it has to be rolled over a certain amount of times in the sink. So when you package that lettuce, it's not getting on a truck and heating up and getting into somebody's belly and making them sick. So there's a lot of risk in agriculture to grow food for people's tummies. I mean, there's a lot of rewards in it too, but there's a lot of risks. In the manufacturing side, there's organizations that come up with good manufacturing practices. There's hazardous, hazard analysis critical control points. This is, uh, I don't even know how to say that uh, acronym, HCAP. These are preventative controls like washing cutting boards and rinsing your fingers, uh, cross-contamination and stuff like that. I'm not bursting anybody's bubble on starting an agriculture business. Don't get me wrong. I just feel as an educator, I'm kicking good information out there. I'm kicking reliable information out there for you to digest. Allergen and contaminant notifications are risk. That would be your peanut allergies and things like that. Shellfish allergies, got to be mindful of that if you're doing a jam or a jelly or labeling something that's, uh, that's pressurized. You have to put these things on your label. There's a lot of different insurances that can help and a lot of different organizations that can help come up with uh, solutions to a lot of these different things here to manage this as a risk. And one of the things that you can do is think through where the touch points might be on your farm and actually put them in writing in a little risk management plan in your business plan. So when you're, when you're pitching your idea for buy-in or for funding, the people that you're pitching to will understand, yeah, I've took, taken the time to think through some of these different scenarios. It's risky to, um, to, have grow, to grow too big too fast, you know, to grow yourself out of a market. And it's also um, risky to look at unrealistic break-evens and unrealistic profits. So we want to be true with scenarios of our production and our unit costs, because ultimately here, it's not a risk, but it's the, the last bullet. The sustainability is not a risk, but it's something that I wanted to kind of close this slide out on and remind you that all these uh, different bullets lead to sustainability. So uh, we want to be in business today and tomorrow. So by managing risks, we stand a better chance. Some of the different insurances that can help us with this in agriculture that are specific to ag or our general farm liability plans, our commercial business liability insurances, our product liability insurances. There are some additional types of insurance that you can purchase for your agriculture business, which would be product recall insurance, accidental and or product contamination insurance, and malicious tampering insurance. And there's one, there's one that I learned about during COVID-19, which was uh, delivery and transport insurance. There was, a, there was a milk hauler that needed to modify his insurance because he was going to different farms to pick up milk. And there's, a, there's, a, there's only one tank on the milk truck, but you're blending four or five different farms worth of milk into one tank and there's insurance to make sure that one farm doesn't have any kind of milk other than the best quality possible to blend in with the rest and if you don't there's insurance to cover that i'm not an insurance expert but like i said i'm just kicking up some information out there to you on starting an agricultural business or growing an entrepreneur some insurances that are very specific to agriculture or crop insurances um, these are not really related to food businesses, but for our crop and row crop farmers, tobacco, soybean, corn, wheat, uh, people take out crop insurance policies. Uh, you can have these multi peril these MPCI, traditional crop insurances. And again, I'm not the expert. This is a slide out of my food for profit class. And typically I'll have an agricultural insurance expert come in and guest speak 
but I just wanted to mention some of these different types of insurance. We do have specialty crop insurances. This would be for our tobaccos and for maybe our cut flowers. If you are a farmer that has many different enterprises, which would, would be divisions of your farm, growing multiple crops, you can have a whole farm crop insurance, or you can have just levels of um, combined revenues from those crops insured. The bottom one here on the right is the uh, non-insured crop disaster assistance program, which is called NAP. <coughs> Excuse me a second. And these insurances kick in when you have low yields, loss of inventory, or preventing planning from natural disasters like floods or hurricanes or hail. I know out of Penn State main campus, we had a hailstorm that took out some of the apple blossoms on the research farm in, uh, in Adamstown, as well as it did in a few farms in a surrounding area. So that would have been a time when this uh, crop disaster insurance would have kicked in to help cover loss of revenue. So the other question that I get about risk as far as starting an agricultural business is if you're thinking about funding this agricultural business, you're going in to put, uh, put together a potential bank loan or going to visit a lender, do you merge your personal assets in as collateral for a startup? And I know that, that Leo does a lot of work in entrepreneurship too, so this might be something that he's heard too, but I, I do hear this, um, do, I, do I put my house up as collateral for my farming business? Um, and I try to, I try to normally tell people if you don't have to, please don't. You know, if if the land, if the operational land can be enough collateral, and you don't have to have your home in there, I would separate the home and start an LLC to uh, mitigate liability. I have to be mindful that I am not an agricultural law attorney, nor am I um, in a position to give you direct financial advice on putting your personal assets at risk. But I think it's worth thinking through. If it's not necessary, I wouldn't do it. The bank is going to look at your credit score and many other characteristics of yourself and elements of your business proposal, including your uh, capacity to pay them back, the collateral loan conditions or terms, your capital investment, and uh, the character of you. So it's all going to be a blend of do we need to put personal assets in there? Do I need to take the, the house out? Can I separate just the land value? Maybe it's the growing crops in the field, like in a micro loan that are going to be enough collateral for, for the loan and you need to keep, you can keep personal assets out. But uh, it all comes down to a few things. We want to give people great value, whether your personal assets are in there or not. We want to give people great value with our products that we sell and grow. I think it's always neat to think about grassroots marketing, give people samples. Now, there are a couple of regulations to keep in mind with giving samples of hot food, little, little pieces of cheese or a bite of a tomato or things like that, but it's nothing that needs to scare anybody. Like that solution access value education model, we want to educate the people on not only how you've grown this agriculture product, whether it's a green bell pepper or tomato or sweet corn, but also ideas for recipes, how to make the best food they can with the food that you've just grown and how to store the food. You know, do you wash it? Do you put it in the refrigerator? Do you keep it on the shelf? Do you have to put it, put like for, for example, to store basil, you have to put it in a moist paper towel. If you just put it on the counter, it's gonna wilt. If you put it in the refrigerator, it loses its intensity. Um, so yeah, quality is everything in agriculture and it needs to speak for itself, but, uh, hopefully some of these things will get you out there thinking about, uh, digging right into an agricultural idea or furthering an idea that you might have, you know, get out there and plow into it. The, uh, the workshop that we are in right now is again, part of Penn State Extension. 
And if you're interested in learning a little bit more about this or any other workshop, you can go to uh, our extension website, extensionpsu.edu. We have articles, news, online courses, guides and publications, videos like this one. I guess it'll be on YouTube, I guess. Uh, might be might be able to put it into Penn State Extension as well. I, that's not up to, for me to decide, but we also have webinars and workshops. So I wanted to say a big, big, big thank you for tonight. I'm Apologize that I was a little choppy and out of order at times. I just get a little excited when I get to talk about farming as an entrepreneurial idea. So um, if we have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Or if I don't know the answer, I can find it and get back with you. So um, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can um, either use the raise hand function in Zoom, or you can post them in the, uh, in the chat. And if not, then we will, uh, we will close for today. And uh, like I said in the beginning, this will be um, uh, up on our YouTube channel. And John, I'll talk to you about um, providing you the, the raw uh, video so you can upload it to um, to your extension site as well. Um, That'd be all right, nice. doesn't, doesn't look like we have any questions, so I guess we'll we'll close for today. I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, very much appreciated. Uh, we have another uh, workshop coming up on uh, April 9th, uh, April twenty ninth, um, which is a uh, an entrepreneur named Steve Barry who uh, founded a design firm called Thought Merchants. Um, and he's going to walk us through what it takes to become an entrepreneur. And it's going to be a very, uh, very interesting, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. So, John, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Uh, and um, we'll look forward to having you back uh, for, uh, for maybe for round two in the fall. That sounds great, Leo. It was really a pleasure. I, I'm so glad that we were able to take what we a conversation from months ago and make this happen tonight. So uh, yes, very much my pleasure and thank you so much. Becky, I appreciate all your help too. Awesome. Thank you very much, John. Uh, thank everybody again and, and uh, have a good rest of the week.